welcome to my video on the emigre by carol rumens we're going to have a look um, and listen um, to the poem and hopefully you will be able to complete your own amity of the poem um, through making notes and then finally write a paragraph on the poet's intention with a view to be able to making links to other poems by the end so let's get started Okay, so now that you've heard the poem, I'd like you to look back through line by line and see if you can match each of the images on this slide to a line in the poem. This will help you to be able to visualise the poem as you read it and pick out some of the key quotations that you can discuss in your analysis later on. So pause the video here and jot those down and make sure you can pinpoint each of those pictures with a line from the poem. Now let's look at some of the symbolism um, in this particular poem. Firstly, let's point out that each stanza ends with the same word, which is sunlight. Now, what could this represent? It is our lasting impression at the end of each stanza and also the very last word of the poem altogether. Think really carefully about what sunlight represents and why that repetition exists. What is there for a lasting impression as readers at the end of this poem, symbolically? Secondly, let's have a look at the highlighted words in blue here. They all represent light imagery. So we have sunlight clear, bright, white, glow, clearer, white, again, as well as those three sunlight words. Notice the patterning of the structuring with those highlighted words. As the poem moves through, what happens to that clear, bright, hopeful, symbolic imagery? Then, Towards the end of the poem, we have this introduction of darkness and shadow, despite the poem ending on that last sunlight. What could that represent as we move through the poem towards the final feeling? Have a jot down of some notes. This will help you with your about section of your amity but also with your overall understanding of this poem. So let's talk about some kind of context here. We need to understand the poem to be able to write about it in full. So this represents a kind of emotional conflict here for the narrator. Because an emigree is normally a person who has been forced to leave their country for political or social reasons. That's what the word represents. This poem in particular begins with those memories of the country that was left as a child. So we're talking about an adult figure here reminiscing, looking back at their country that they grew up in. It's nostalgic. Whatever news the speaker receives of their country, it cannot detract from the impression, that lasting impression of sunlight that she associates with her lost country. I say her, the emigree, because of the um, figuring, if you know from your languages, um, of that E with the um, mark above it means that it is a female narrator. She, therefore, is um, female and she has left her country. Darkness, death and shadow feature in the last four lines, but the final word is sunlight. Could that be significant? Um, is she finally becoming optimistic about her future in this new world that is no longer letting the light in because she's left her original country? So overall, this poem tracks this new life the emigree has left her original country since she was a child, carries it with her into her new life and new existence in this new city. It shows us this kind of emotional conflict 
for somebody as a non-native speaker, a non-origin um, uh, person living in this new world. It's that battle between the homage to where you grew up and your identity, but also the kind of acceptance of your new self in this new place. Could this therefore be a larger metaphor for something else? Perhaps the feeling of not fitting in, of being an outsider in a new world, of having to change and adapt. So given that we've looked at the title already, let's have a look then line by line on stanza one. So in the first line, we have this sejura here in the middle of the first line, this elongated ellipsis there. So there once was a country, I left it as a child. So it gives us this paused catch up. It gives it almost like a, a storybook start like once upon a time, there once was a country. It makes it sound quite mystical, quite fairy tale as that opening. And then that second half of the first line almost makes it sad. I left it as a child. It puts us into this past tense and sets us up for this memory, this reminiscence. Then we have obviously the sunlight clear. Her memory of it is sunlight clear, which tells us that it's a vivid memory, irrespective of that passing of time. Remember that time is a theme, and as time has gone on, her memory of her country that she left is still pristine. It is sunlight clear. Obviously, sunlight is clear and yet is not clear. It's almost paradoxical in that sense. Later on, we are told that she never saw it in November, which comes to the mildest city. So again, it tells us it's quite an eastern. If it's mild in November, we're not over here in the west. Then we're told about there's some bad news. The worst news I receive of it, the country, cannot break my original view. So she's hearing bad things about her country, having left it, and yet her original, her first view of it, is from this pristine memory that she has as a child. Nothing can tarnish that. Then she describes her original view as a bright filled paperweight. And this metaphor here tells us that the country is colourful, it is vivid, it is decorative, like a paperweight, but also functional. It is there, it is put down, it does not move, it keeps things under control. It may be at war, it may be sick with tyrants. Now here the country is at war, it is also sick with tyrants. The personification here shows us that the country is now ill. Humanity, tyrannical humans, have spoilt her country, her personified country, and made it ill and at war. But I am branded by an impression of sunlight. Here, branded, that verb tells us it's permanent. She is marked physically as well as mentally by her country. It denotes who she is. This is about her identity. And this is not a necessarily literal branding, more of a metaphorical one. But that impression of sunlight from her, on her memory, on her identity is permanent. Stanza two. So we start again with that light imagery, the white streets of that city, the graceful slopes. The description of her city here is pleasant, it's pleasing, white is pure, it's innocent. Um, it's also very light again and delicate. They glow even clearer as time rolls its tanks. So here we have time personified. Uh, time is the enemy because it's rolling its tanks. Obviously tanks are um, weapons um, used in wartime by humanity. Uh, so time is personified here as attacking her memory, her bright, pristine, innocent, pure, 
memory, um, this humanized, weaponized time. So as time is moving on, it is trying to destroy her pure memory of her city. The frontiers rise between us close like waves. Now the simile here, um, close like waves, the frontiers rising. Frontiers are obviously barriers. They're usually boundaries of countries. Um, and here, the simile, I've drawn you some waves, look, um, the frontiers that come between her original country and the one that she's currently in are rising up, okay, between them like barriers over and over and over again. She feels like over and over and over there are more and more boundaries between her and her origin, um, her original country. Also, the use of the simile here, close like waves, is a natural, obviously, nature and the power of nature we've seen before. And this is unusual because barriers and frontiers and boundaries, as we saw in tissue, are quite man-made constructs. And yet we're using this repetition of the wave, something that's uncontrolled, that will always continue on here to describe something quite humanistic um, in the barriers as well. Then in line 12, we have that child's vocabulary I carried here, as if her vocabulary is something she, she grasped and she's taken with her as well. A child's vocabulary as well would have been the language that she grew up speaking, the language of her origin country. And yet if you have a child's vocabulary, it's not a, a well-rounded yet um, adult vocabulary with all the different terminology and words that we learn as we go through our lives. And here, she carried it here like a hollow doll. This simile here shows the emptiness of her language. Um, then it opens and spills a grammar. It's an irony here with spills a grammar in that it's not a westernised grammatical construct here. It's almost as if she's tongue tied because she carries over her original language and has to blend that in with this westernised language here as well. And there's that emptiness of the original language now that she's been removed, been forcibly removed from her country. But then she says, soon I shall have every coloured molecule of it, every single bit of it. And we don't know whether she's referring here to her need to extend her original vocabulary. Will she take on all of that original language and learn it independently to take it with her? Or does she mean this new westernised language here? It's a bit ambiguous. You make of that what you wish. Line 15, it may now be a lie banned by the state. Here we have, if it's been banned by the state, that's the power of humanity to restrict her language. Her language is now a lie and banned. It is um, rebellious of her to try and um, keep it, to keep hold of it, to use it. Um, and here we have this again, power of humanity to restrict and suppress language. It's almost oppressive. So we had tyrannical um, things earlier and now we have banned state measures. But I can't get it off my tongue. It tastes of sunlight. And here, that not being able to get her accent, her original language off her tongue as if it's with her metaphorically always and she cannot remove it yet she thinks it tastes of sunlight sunlight is pure and hopeful and blissful she wants to keep her accent she wants to keep her original language she loves it and yet it stays with her every time she speaks she cannot get it off her tongue stanza three so we start off this stanza with i have no passport, there's no way back at all. This is about identity. I have no passport, there's no way back, means that she cannot return. Her identity, her document that proves her country of origin has been denied and taken 
from her. There's no way back at all. She cannot return to the country. It is about, again, um, removal um, of identity and that restriction of humanity. E similar, very similar here to some of the um, things that are mentioned in tissue as well, which links quite nicely to this poem. However, in line two, we have, but my city comes to me in its own white plain. The my here and me is very possessive. Those possessive um, pronouns here um, show that she has an ownership of her city and it comes to her. She does not need to go to it because it comes to her. And yet that white plain makes it official. Um, we think about delegates and official people travelling on country business in white planes um, here as well as that colour symbolism of that white, that innocence, that purity, that peacefulness that comes with the association of that colour. So it's almost as if the personification here of her city coming in its white plane is personifying her city as being like a delegate, an international representation of her country coming to visit her. It's unlikely that that's true, so this is obviously again a metaphor here um, and part of that personified nature of her country. Then in line um, 19, we get an almost animalistic personification here. It lies down in front of me, so still her country lies down in front of me, docile as paper. Um, so the lying down is submissive, almost like a pet, like a dog or a cat, um, that's submissive, that lies down um, for to seek comfort docile as well, tells that it's calm, it's delicate, it's gentle, and yet paper doesn't seem gentle. There's an almost odd uh, juxtapositioning here between this kind of tranquility of the personified city and the kind of stark harshness of paper. But yet again, paper is white, another nice link as well to tissue here, um, because paper represents identity and documentation and things like that here. Um, and yet on line 20, I comb its hair and love its shining eyes. Um, so it's almost as if it's a pet, it needs care, it needs nurture, its shining eyes could represent love or tears and life here. It's certainly being submissive towards her now and she sees it as companionship and something that needs nurture and care. Then in line 21, we get personified in a different way. My city takes me dancing through the city of walls. And Jean Mint there takes it through to line 22 as well. And here the city, it's almost as if it's um, a partner or a friend taking her dancing. It's fun, it's active, and that's then juxtaposed through the city of walls. So that in the city of walls, which is that restrictive, controlling, and um, fencing in city and yet her city is free and fun and charismatic and is taking her and trying to cheer her up despite her surroundings. Then we have here the sejura um, in line 22 followed by they accuse me of absence. They circle me. They accuse me of being dark in their free city. The anaphora there, the they, 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 is that repetition. The anaphora is reinforcing that othering. It is them against us. That pronoun of they shows difference and they are collective and she is singular. Okay, so there is this othering going on of the people who accuse her of absence, of not being there, of not being attentive and there they circle me as well. That's again humanistic power of um, kind of containment, of almost bullying, of entrapment. They accuse me of being dark in their free city. It's almost ironic here that they are accusing her of being, could it be, is it racism here? Is it a metaphor? Is the darkness about being 
evil or nasty rather than the, the literal darkness perhaps of the colour of the skin. You get to read into that what you will but the irony comes from her kind of calling out this almost hypocrisy of they are calling me bad and yet they encircle me, they accuse me of this, they accuse me of that. Um, in their free city. She's just reminded us it's the city of walls. And so there's an irony. Apparently it's free, but all this restriction is here. It's making an almost political or certainly social statement here. And then we have another personification here of the city as almost being childlike or certainly terrified, which changes from that kind of needing nurturing to almost needing full protection. My city hides behind me. So now her city seeks physical protection by putting itself behind her for protection as if it's a child hiding behind its mother. So we have this kind of maternal image here and she needs to act as a physical barrier to protect the personified city in this line. They, again here, mutter death. Is this, again, a form of racism? Is this a threat? Are they just um, accusing again? They mutter death is quite severe. Another image of darkness, like the darkness that was occurred earlier. Um, are they being, you know, racist here? Or are they um, accusing her of causing death? And then finally, line 30, and my shadow falls as evidence of sunlight. And this is the moment when she feels empowered because her shadow, her darkness falls away as a result of sunlight. So as we know, the point in the day when your shadow disappears is when the sun is at its peak when the sun is at the top of the sky, most strength, as there is no shadow because it is directly above. And here her shadow falls as a result, as evidence of sunlight. So it's like her empowerment, her country is with her and the light that she holds in her memory shines through and the shadows fall away. Um, is it female empowerment? Is it standing up against racism? You can read into that what you will, depending on your previous interpretations of the previous lines. Something to think about. OK, so Poet's Intention, this will help you with your, your response part of your amity. I'd like you to spend five minutes re-examining the poem, look back at the imagery, structure and context, try to work out what the poet's intention is with this poem. So you can think about different kind of takes on this. Is it about a poem being about a foreigner from a different land and finding acceptance um, through difficulties? However, could it be actually a larger metaphor about the difference between darkness and light and hope and humanity? What is the poet trying to get us as readers to think about through this poem? I'd like you to make notes alongside your text or in your books to evidence your opinion, please, for your amity response. You can pause the video here and pick up when you've done this. Using your notes that you've just made, I'd like you to see if you can pick some quotations that would fit quite nicely into this um, already prepped small model paragraph. So in this paragraph, I've written some ideas and I'd like you to look back, please, um, through your notes and pick at least one or two quotations that would support what has been written here. So it says, in the poem The Emigre by Carol Rumans, the reader is shown how emotional conflict can cause a person to be stuck between two places. Rumans uses light and darkness to represent the emotional conflict of the narrator who feels stuck between their love of their birth country and the life they must now lead. This is representational of all emotional conflict, how torn one can feel when they do not feel wholly accepting of who they are. I'd like you please to look back over your notes to have a look and find two, one to two quotations that can support 
this analysis and then extend this model paragraph in your notes. Finally, we need to begin to think about which other poems we can link together with this particular one. The emigre actually works quite nicely with quite a range of different poems. Um, so you could link The Power of Humanity um, to Ozymandias in London, the way that uh, humanity, the dictatorship and the romantic period with the Industrial Revolution and the French Revolution and things um, kind of force control onto the populace. And um, so that links quite nicely here with the control of the power of humanity and how she struggles in this poem. You've also got Kamikaze has a similar narrative feel um, to the poem and also discusses memory and the importance of memory um, and love of one's country and patriotism. Um, you've also got Storm on the Island. That shows, it doesn't link quite as nicely, but shows the power of nature as being able to destroy and equally, um, the other side, replenish um, one's emotional well-being. So on Storm of the Island, obviously nature is starting to attack humanity, is personified as attacking and destructive, and yet here the sunlight in this poem is almost the antithesis. It's, it's nurturing and protecting her and replenishing her. Um, so there's a nice comparison there. You've got Charge of the Light Brigade, so obviously their death, destruction caused by humanity and war. You can link that to Time Rolls Its Tanks and the Sick with Tyrants lines. And then Tissue is quite a really nice poem to link across, um, deals with identity, power of paper and documentation to feel part of one's country. In Tissue, it says we don't need those things, um, we should kind of set them free and be unrestrained by those things. And yet here in the emigre, they're the things she longs for, for that passport, for that freedom to be able to talk her language um, openly without restrictions. So make sure you've got down some other ideas of which poems you would link across with the emigre for your revision. Thank you so much for listening um, and I hope you enjoyed the poem.